Before we start, I've got to be honest with you about something. Um, when we recorded this episode with Mel C, um, it was honestly one of the most moving, heartbreaking, inspiring, revealing conversations I've ever had on this podcast. And I've been looking forward to sharing this conversation with you for some time now. Um, and then we had an incident where one of our hard drives was stolen and we lost the audio for Mel's mic, which is really, really heartbreaking because of all the episodes to lose the audio for, for it to be this one is, has been very hard to deal with. And I think uh, I wanna start by apologizing to Mel because she came here, she shared her story in such a profound, vulnerable way. And I've carried the sense of guilt because, um, because when people come here, not only are they giving us their time, but they're giving us their story. And for some people, as is the case in this conversation, it's the first time that that story has been shared in this way. So I've been really struggling with that, but because it was such a profound story and to, to make sure we honor all of that, which Mel gave us by coming here, um, we spent a lot of time fixing the, the audio we do have, which actually comes from one of the cameras that's rolling, not from the microphone in front of her. We've worked with a specialist to try and repair the audio as much as we possibly can. And this is one of the episodes where I'm asking you for a favor, which is to stay with us. I know it's not always easy to listen to audio when it's not as crisp as this audio sounds right now, but there's a story underneath the um, lack of clarity in the audio, the lack of crispness, crispness in the audio that needs to be heard. It's one of the, the most amazing stories we've ever shared. Um, and so I hope you enjoy this episode. And we've put many, 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 many measures in place to make sure that um, we never lose any audio or any footage ever again. In this case, it was out of our control, but um, this episode is worth it, so we're putting it out anyway. You're gonna enjoy it. There's an element of guilt attached to my success. It was joyless, you know, because I had a secret and it was killing me. Melanie C! <laughs> the early days of the Spice Girls were the best and I feel blessed, but with it has been some really tough times. It was fucking dramatic how it went down. The tabloid media were brutal. We all got called terrible, horrible things. Did you notice a change in yourself at all after that? Definitely, that was the catalyst. Why? I became very, very ill. I couldn't control my eating. I was struggling to get out of bed. It was killing me. I think, did becoming famous ruin my life? Did it ruin me? Sometimes I question that. And yeah, that's my mind. I might need a minute. Without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. When I, when I sit here with people, I'm, I, I always try and figure out the best starting point. I always know I'm going to start at the very beginning. But with you, when I was reading through your story, it was quite clear to me that the things that shaped you started at a very, very young age. I'm talking when you were two, three and four years old. So can you take me right back to the very start? I'm guessing that's like sort of 1976-ish. It is. And you're right. You know, things that happened to me when I was a toddler really defined a lot of who I became. I grew up just outside Liverpool and I was born in Western Hospital. My parents and I lived in a place called Rain Hill and they divorced when I was, I think I was about three years old. And my life kind of quite quickly changed, you know, as lots of young people would be affected like that. And yeah, that was where the story began. I think me developing this need to succeed. When you say your life changed, give me a colour to, to what that means for you. So I was living quite comfortably with mum and dad, you know, the kind of happy archetypal family life. And um, my mum, um, we left, me and my mum left and we went to live with my grandparents. And then we, we went to live um, in quite a different area. We were still only about 30 minutes away, but it, it was quite different. We went into um, council accommodation and my, um, quite quickly, my mum was in a new relationship. So there was this new guy around 
and it was just kind of it just you know looking back it was just very different to the world I'd entered into when I first turned upon this planet. What was your um your family's sort of economic situation throughout this journey was it were you a, a working class family or absolutely yeah I mean my family still are you know very working class you know through the generations and my mum and dad were doing you know they were doing good we had a lovely semi-detached house in a in a nice suburb of, of you know Liverpool and obviously with my mum leaving dad as today you know lots of couples find that it is very difficult to to start again um so we were yeah going into a situation where it was hard for mum to make ends meet so it was yeah it was it was quite a, a tough area to be um to be growing up in where was your dad so dad was still in the house in the, the house you'd been raised in yeah. for those first few yeah. years and then after i think a couple of years he went traveling and um, yeah, and then he went to work abroad, actually. So I've always seen a lot of my dad, but there were periods of times when he was away. So um, yeah, so it was a bit of a shake up, quite early, they're formative years, aren't they? Mm. And you're that little, you don't think about it because as a child, your life is your life. But I think when you start to think about who you are and how you became that person, you start to, you just kind of pinpoint maybe little moments that put you on that track. So when you look back to that that experience of your parents separating at a very young age and then your life shifting and um, in hindsight, what impact did that have on you? Like when you look back and connect those dots, you can go, oh, that, that's the reason for that. I think it kind of confused me, I think, as a young person to have my location change, you know, to be taken from the family home and obviously I was tiny so I didn't understand you know I didn't understand adult relationships I didn't understand why it was happening so this little series of events and then you know I have a new I've got a stepdad and then I had a new sibling and then I had stepbrothers and so there was just there was just quite a lot of big things happening in my little world and it made me just kind of confused to like where I belonged, who I was, how I fitted in to that new dynamic. And, you know, as I got older and my dad remarried and I have this incredible family, it's very complicated and it's huge. And I have half siblings and step siblings and step parents and, and it's lovely. But I think for me, being the only child of my mum and dad sometimes made me feel a little bit of a spare part. And I think that's what made me feel like I had to make myself a place in the world, my own place in the world. And I think also it was about kind of earning the love of these people. I kind of felt like I had to prove that I was worthy of ex existence. It sounds melodramatic, but I think as a, as a young person, you, I mean, especially going through my teenage years, you, you question everything, don't you? You know, why are we here? And a lot of that for me was like, do I deserve to be here? And so I had to make myself worthy of being here. And you think that started because of the, your parents' separation and in this new context of these other siblings that were felt maybe belonged more than... Yeah, I, I, think, I think especially when, you know, both my parents remarried and they're both really happily remarried and have gone on to have more children. And I love my parents and I love my step-parents and all of my siblings. But for me, I, I sometimes feel quite alone. And I think that is what propelled me and some of the issues I went on to have in later life, uh, you know, for good and for bad. You know, I think there's been real benefits to those feelings. Um, it's made me very determined, um, very conscientious, but also it's made me very hard on myself and a little bit of a perfectionist. One of the things that I was quite surprised to read was this almost contradiction between you, you really looked up to your dad. You, you, I think you wrote in your book that you almost worshipped him, but then when he left... It was almost like there wasn't there wasn't a reaction from you. Yeah, I know it, it's so strange to me. It's hard when you're that young, isn't it? Because your own memories are such little tiny snippets, and you remember, and we all remember things differently. But for my dad, you know, I did. I, I put him on a pedestal, and I still do. You know, he's my hero, and he always will be. But yeah, he he went away, and he went away for his own reasons. And as an adult, I completely understand that, you know. And he needed to do that. But yeah, I kind of shut down, I think. And I think I kind of 
I have learned in my life, which has been really useful in my career, that I can have these incredibly intense emotional feelings, but they have to be buried. Not healthy, but helpful sometimes. <laughs> in the short term. Yeah. Yeah. But I think if you if your knowledge, you know, you have the knowledge that you do that, I think that can help in just maybe not doing it or, or trying to is that the first time you, you kind of recall that, those early years where you think you might have just buried a set of emotions and not addressed them, that, that blocking out of it just to keep on keeping on? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think some of it is my personality, but I think some of it was circumstance that I kind of, I don't like to rock the boat. I don't want to cause people problems. I want to always make sure everybody's okay. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with worthiness, you know, feeling unworthy potentially. Um, just, just to, so I'm completely clear in my own mind, because I, I don't want to make any assumptions. That feeling of like m not feeling worthiness came from that dysfunctional family dynamic. That's the first sort of hint you have of it. I, I think so. I think looking back, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And for me, in the environment I was in at that time, it was really unusual that parents separated. Hmm. All of my friendship group, they had, to me, what... I saw as their happy family, you know, the family unit. And I longed for that and I didn't have that and it made me different. And obviously, you know, fast forward to today and I think it's probably rarer to have the family unit, you know, life has changed so much. So that's how it affected me at the time. It, it made me feel like, yeah, an outsider and a bit strange. You moved to um, Runcorn with your mother, which is... Um where the, the council estate is where you lived mm. what that area isn't a good area back then yeah you know it, i mean runcorn is it's a, like a satellite town of liverpool and lots of people you know it's kind of like overspill um lots of people were out there and this this particular estate that we we got housed in was it was built and it, it was obviously there were so many families that needed to be housed very much like today and it was this oh, like a bizarre architecture and um, we had these huge round windows and there was little houses they were like, we used to call them the lego houses because they were like blue and yellow it was you know i suppose at the time it, it seemed very forward thinking but i think unfortunately you know it was it was one of those environments of which there are still many um where you know problems can occur because it's it's kind of set up there are you know, there are just opportunities, I suppose, for people to be quite discreet. And there was, you know, lots of people there who were struggling. And it was, I think it was knocked down. I think they started knocking it down in about 1990 because it just kind of got, yeah, too run down, I think. When you, um, when you look back on your, your father's decision to leave, is there any feelings of like, I don't know, animosity towards that decision? To, for him to leave your life. I understand the, the separation, but for him to then be absent seems like it was, from reading your book, the, a catalyst moment for other things to then happen. Was, has there ever been any animosity towards when you reflected on it as you grew up? No. Really? No, there really hasn't. Because I think, you know, just that thing of being a kid and your life is your life, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just that you get told something like, oh, okay then. And I think when I became a parent, and I think about my daughter, and obviously I work away a lot, you know? Um, but I just, yeah, it's, it's weird. I, I don't think you really fully, I don't think you ever fully understand your parents, but I think you get a much better understanding of them when you become a parent, you know? But at the end of the day, I think as a child, you look up to these adults thinking, you know, they know how everything should be and how everything should be done. And then when you become an adult, you're like, yeah, I'm 50 in a year and a half and I still haven't got a clue. So, and I still feel like a child, you know, and my mom says, I feel like a teenager. Um, and it's like, and I get that now. We're all just trying to figure it out throughout our lives. You know, I don't think we ever get to that age where we go, yeah, I've got it now. Dancing <clears throat> seemed to be your first love as I was reading through your story. Yeah. Where did that show up? Where did dancing come from? You know, I think like so many young kids, 
you have this moment where you may go to ballet or disco or whatever the the local you know is in the the local club or whatever and i went on to ballet and tap when i was so little i can't even remember but it must have struck a chord with me because when we moved to Roncon, it was there was no way mum could afford for me to do dance classes so i had this period of time without it we moved to Witness when I was, I think I was eight years old, and that's when I picked up dancing again. And I think I'd really like bugged my mum for years. I want to go back to dancing. I want to go back. I want to go back. And I did sports at school. You know, I've always, I'm just very active. I'm, I think, was probably one of those kids who never sat still. You know, I was always outside. I was always upside down or kicking a ball or something. And dancing for me, it was just a way of expressing myself and a freedom. And it was almost like a safe place safe place like many performers and I'm, I'm sure you've spoken to lots of people who are like this that i'm quite shy in certain aspects of my life maybe like in a social aspect um you know being at school i kept my head down i wasn't very academic i did okay but when i was dancing when i was doing something creative and being able to express myself i felt very confident and free and alive so yeah dancing school was where i really felt in my element so, so you became a very obsessive dancer, practicer, very meticulous. Yeah, I think there's something about classical ballet and the training of that, which there's a lot of discipline and it just really works for me. And, and even now, you know, I, I have to have an awareness of this, that it's to have those parameters and to have that discipline makes me feel safe. I don't really know where that comes from. But I am, I'm very hard on myself and I kind of, I think I'm a little bit of a workaholic because I feel like when I'm in a workspace and I'm being very disciplined, that I'm safe. One might guess that um, if parameters and discipline and that structure makes you feel safe, then there might have been a time where a lack of parameters made you feel unsafe or a lack of a foundation made you feel unsafe. Absolutely. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. I think there was a lot of, you know, my mum's a performer oh. and, you know, it's, it's so, it's so weird now because obviously I find myself in, in a similar position, but she'd be away not an awful lot. But there'd be times when I'd be staying with other people or, you know, having babysitters and, uh, you know, maybe there was a little bit of instability felt there and that would definitely make sense. A bit of instability. Is this, are you talking to, talking about your nanny? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a little period of time where, yeah, my mum had employed someone to look after me who, um, you know, she felt was, was a great person for that role. But unfortunately, you know, the girl, she was maybe a little bit too young to take on that responsibility and had kind of moved me out of our home and I'd moved in with, with her mum. And, uh, yeah, it was all... A little bit shady, but yeah, as soon as mum found out, she put an end to it. But I think I was very quiet about it because I was so little. I think I was only about five. So um, I chose not to tell her. Probably didn't want to rock the boat. What were you telling her? Um, that I wasn't at home and that I wasn't being taken care of by the girl she'd employed to take care of me. That feels like a, a, a light way of saying something that is a little less light in reality well you know again i was so young it was i don't think it's until i've got older that i thought that's that's probably something that would affect you in a big way but at the time it was just my life you recite this moment of, of just waiting for this per this person that was meant to be taking care of you um just not showing up on many occasions and you having to wait outside and weighing your pants at one point because you were waiting outside so long mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember getting back from school and we had these you know, horrible, damn concrete steps up to the flat door and no one was home and yeah, just busting for the toilet. And yeah, I wet myself and luckily the, the neighbour came home and she took me in and kind of cleaned me up and yeah. So that's, I mean, again, I was so young. There's, there's just these little flashes of memories of those things. I think I think when you're when you're young you maybe don't it's not that those I think about my own life like it's not that those things don't aren't impacting you it's you don't you're not really aware of the impact they're having or the stories that they're they're making you write about yourself and about your situation um and then obviously it's oftentimes it seems that we including myself then see the consequences of it and in hindsight have to 
pe- pe- sort of piece together where that came from. Mm. But that's, I mean, when I, when I read that um, in your book, I was, I mean, that's, that's almost like criminal neg- negligence to treat a child in such a way. And I think about the, your, your, the departure of your father, your mum then departing to go and pursue her career. And then you, you ultimately ending up on these steps, you know, urinating your underwear because of this negligent uh, nanny. And that's, you know, that, that's where I think, oh, that is, you know, that must have been formative in, in, to, some, to some degree. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a big believer in therapy and I've been having it for many years. Um, probably I only started to do that because of my time with the Spice Girls and how much of a head fuck that was. But it's really interesting because you do look at your habits and the things that you do and why you do them. And so much of it comes back to your childhood. Dancing was your first love. Um, you, you become very disciplined at that and eventually off you go to um, study in London mm-hmm. and that's where you find singing. Yeah. Which you hadn't, had you been doing it before? You know, because my mum was a singer and she had deals in the 70s, she had a couple of record deals with different bands, but, you know, it hadn't worked out the way she would have liked it to. Um, you know, she did great, but didn't get to those heights that all of us performers would like to get to. So I just knew growing up, it's really, really hard. Working in the music industry is really difficult. So, you know, my young brain goes, okay, I want to be a pop star, but it's really hard. So I love dancing and I love singing. So theatre, because I loved musical theatre as well. I went to performing arts college and I was pursuing that. And I'd sung a little bit, but I just, I never really had confidence in my voice. But there was this like weird thing of, it just gave me so much joy, actually more joy than dancing. I was in college, I was in my second year, and we had these competitions that would happen every year. And I was singing a song and it was the first time I just had a moment with an audience where they, I just really felt this energy, this transaction between myself and them. And it was when I was singing and it, that was it for me. That was the moment it was like, it is singing that is it that is what i have to do so eventually you um you and 400 other young women res- respond to a advert in a magazine mm-hmm. what was that advert okay so well i so so the stage newspaper was when you leave performing arts college you're an actor a, a dancer a singer whatever you go for your auditions the stage is where you find your auditions find myself at an audition i didn't want to be at handed a flyer for a girl band and I'm like, that's it. And that's what I'm going to do. You, you get handed a flyer. A lot of people are being handed that flyer. Mm-hmm. Did you know then that you would, you said, that's it. That's what I want to do. Did you know then that you wanted to be in a girl band or did you mean that's it? I'm going to apply. And I think that's more befitting of what I, where I want to go. It's hard to know exactly because of what's happened since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah of course. But my, but my telling of the story is, I mean, I just had a really strong feeling at that time that I was going to, whatever this thing was, mm. I was going to be a part of it and it was going to be something incredible. What did that flyer say? I think it said something like, are you 18 to 24 I think it was like the wording of it, streetwise, can dance, sing, fun loving, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just basically an audition, an open audition, mm-hmm. anyone come along, we're putting a girl band together, okay. music management. And yeah, I went along to that audition. And how did that go? It went well. I was recalled, we had to dance, and then we were recalled to sing. And then we were all sent away and then we were, we were called back. But when we were called back, I was ill and I couldn't speak, let alone sing. So, um, yeah, I, I missed my first opportunity of being in this band. You missed your first opportunity? Yeah, so I was really sick. I kept getting tonsillitis. And I, yeah, I was really poorly when the recall happened. And so I begged my mum to call him and just say, give him a new week, let her get better, she'll come and sing for you. But they were like, no, we've, we've already chosen the girls, it's, I'm afraid. It's a no this time. And there was lots of auditions that were no's. So it was like, oh, well, it wasn't meant to be. But then a couple of weeks after that, I got a call to say, somebody hasn't worked out. We'd like to see Melanie again. And then that was my chance to get in the band. 
Christ. That is a pivotal phone call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's bizarre. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I think I often think about the other girls who had potentially because that still wasn't the five that everybody mm. got to know. You know, there was, I think, there were three girls from the the beginning of the band being put together who didn't end up being part of the final lineup of the Spice Girls. It's funny, isn't it? When you think back, at even being handed that flyer, mm-hmm. you think, what path would I have walked potentially if that person that day hadn't given me that flyer? It's a really strange thought, isn't it? Yeah, it's a sliding doors moment, isn't it? Mm. But it's like, yeah, I, I really, because often in interviews you'll be asked, oh, if you didn't do this, mm. what would you do? And I'm like, I have no clue. It's funny. <laughs> I think about it because I there was an early early point in my career where I got a phone call saying um, a, a day before saying this sixteen year old kid that was meant to be speaking at this event had dropped out last minute and could I get to London I had no money I end up um, bunking on the mega bus this sixteen year old kid had just sold his business for thirty million so they needed like a young entrepreneur last minute found me because I was on some website at three a.m. asked me to come and that sent me off in my career it was where I got my investors from that one talk I think if he, they hadn't asked me to be there. How would my life have been different? Um, and the weird thought, which we never consider, is that maybe I would have been happier. Mm-hmm. Have you ever have you ever thought that? Mm-hmm. Often, often, yeah. You know, I I wouldn't change my life. Obviously, I'm so proud of the things that I've achieved, and I have an incredible life, and I absolutely do my passion. You know, that's my. I've just had a weekend of it. You know, three shows over the weekend. And I feel blessed, but with it has been some really tough times. And sometimes I do, I do think, wow. I think, did becoming famous ruin my life? Did it ruin me? Sometimes I question that. It's a hard one to answer, isn't it? Because really is. you don't know the alternatives, so you can't. Yeah. But I think the thing is, it's like, you know, it's always so important, isn't it? to remember we're on a journey, right? Mm. What's the destination? The destination is death. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've just got to enjoy this journey. And I remember the early days of the Spice Girls were the best. Before we released anything, we had the most fun because it was this excitement, what's gonna happen? You know, what can it be? And then when it happened, it was incredible, but there's a lot of pressures that come along with it. So everything, starts to change in those early years then so before you've released any music you stumbled around trying to find management for a while right Yeah. and then you recount stories in your book about some like dickheads that made some just like awful comments to you can you tell me about that that comment was his name chick oh chick yeah so he was a financial backer so when we we were first put together by a management team and we were with them maybe for about a year and chick was um yeah, the financial backer of these original managers. And he'd commented on the size of my thighs, um, which was something that really shook me. Because, you know, I went to a performing arts college, which was predominantly a dancing college. And, you know, the body image was an issue there. There was there were girls with eating disorders. I'd, I'd been, you know, I'd been witness to that in my life. But yeah, it never affected me personally. Um, you know, and I'm a teenager, put on a little bit of weight, moving away from home, not really eating as well, going down the pub. And, you know, so my weight fluctuated a little bit, but it was never something that really bothered me. It was just, yeah, I'll cut back a little bit, lose a few pounds. But somebody actually commenting on the way I looked when I was going into a career where so much of it is about how you look really affected me. Did he make that comment in front of people? He made that comment in front of the other girls. There's something about, there's something about um, when you're trying to fit in, when someone points at something which makes you different or that might make you feel like you don't fit in. And from just listening to your early years where fitting in and feeling worthy was so important to you, for someone to then in a group of people where you where you belong, those that, that band to say, this is why you don't fit, essentially, with that comment. I can't think of anything more more hurtful for one's self-esteem. Especially as a young person, because, you know, think about it. I was probably 
19 at that point, which at the time you feel like you're all grown up, you left college, going out into the big wide world. You're a child. You know, you're still so young and so vulnerable. Well, Victoria said to you that he had said comments to her about her weight as well or her appearance. Yeah, I think, you know, it was it was very much at that time. I mean, I, you know, I went to dance college, so teachers would say, you need to lose weight. You know, what's that stomach? I mean, I've spoken to dancers recently about the culture of that because, you know, um, recently there was a lot, there's been a lot talked about in the gymnastics world. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And... There was definitely a culture within dance which was very cruel and heartless and shaming, body shaming, um, which is changing. But, you know, dance teachers, there are some really lovely nurturing ones out there, but some of the best dance teachers are horrible. You know, we, I mean, carrot and the stick, mm-hmm. isn't it? It's quite an old-fashioned way, but it worked in some ways. But it's very damaging. Did it change your behaviour, that that comment from him? Did, did, did you notice a change in yourself at all after that? Definitely. That was the catalyst. That was the catalyst for me to... It was like a wake-up call. It was like, if I want to do this, if I'm going to be a pop star... And you have to remember, this was like the 90s as well. So it was, you know, body image was a very different thing there. You know, thank God there's so much more body, body positivity now, you know. But back then, it was all about being stick thin. And I thought, wow, if I'm going to do this, I have to fit the mould. And so then that was, it was just, it was, it was a gradual thing, but it was like the eating and the exercising. And that's when, that's when it began. Yeah, from a comment like that, which he probably didn't give a second thought to, you know? Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. We never really appreciate that one comment can have such a profound impact and change someone's, um, the trajectory of their health or their well-being in such a significant way. Just one comment. Yeah. Just a few words. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's, it's a bit of a trigger, isn't it? You know, so that happened. And I think obviously I was feeling vulnerable and it knocks your confidence. But then it's kind of, I think it's like a little chain of events that leads you down that road. Right. You know? So that maybe was the little start of it. It ignited it. The first point. domino to fall. Yeah, yeah. On that journey trying to find new management, you you stumbled across Simon Cowell as well, and he <laughs> <laughs> he must hate when you recount this story because <laughs> oh, it's so funny because he this is the thing right everybody remembers things differently because he remembers he said yes to us but we said no to him so basically we got to the point where we were going to record companies we were looking for a record deal so we'd left the, the original management. And we had some demos, demo tapes, and we were going around meeting managers, meeting record labels. And most people were very positive. We got very positive reactions. But we remember Simon saying he wasn't interested in us. Um, Yeah, but he he recounted it differently. So that's funny, isn't it? Because obviously then it was the 90s. He was a a record company exec. He he wasn't known to to the wider public. At this point, when you're going around trying to find management, how are you pro- like providing for yourselves? How, where's the money coming from to sustain the band? And was there ever a moment where you thought, fuck this, I'm going to... No, never, no? never, never, never. So when we were with our original management, they, they did give us like a little bit of pocket money. They put us up in a house. I think they gave us about £60 a week, which, because we weren't paying for our accommodation at the time, you know, we could make ends meet. Um, but when we left them, I think I went to stay with a friend back in Sidcup where I'd been to college. So I was like staying in her spare room. And then there was a period of time where Melanie and Jerry were homeless. They were doing a little bit of sofa surfing. Yeah. And Emma went home to her mum's place in Finchley. And Victoria was back at her mum's place up um, in Hertfordshire. So, yeah, we were. And it was so lovely. This, I remember we go to Emma's mum's place. And she'd do loads of toast for us and wrap it in tin foil, and that would be breakfast. And yeah, we we were just we never thought it was never an option to give up. We were on this journey, and we were going to make it happen. How long was that period when, when, between you leaving your initial management to uh, ultimately when you found Simon Fuller, and you know that kind of it began with Virgin. How long was that? How big was that gap? It, it wasn't as long as a year. Okay. Like within a year. It was maybe about eight months or so. But we, we had um, somebody who was, you know, very kindly looking after us. So what we'd done before we left our original management, we talked our original management into putting on a showcase. 
Okay. So we did that. And then we met some writers and producers and publishers. And we made some contacts. And we, we kind of knew already we were going to leave. But we just thought, oh, let's get this out of them. And we did that. And so we pursued that. And we were with Mark Fox, who was head of publishing at BMG at the time. And he kind of took us under his wing and would take us out for dinners and got us to meet people. And that kind of got us on our road to success. And then you met Simon Fuller. We did. Talk to me about that and how that changed things. Yeah, it was really interesting because we'd been... It's so funny, isn't it? We really did take matters into our own hands and we talk about auditioning managers. You know, we were this unknown girl band. Everyone was telling us girl bands don't work, but we were out there going, right, is this manager good enough for us? Um, so we just, we just had this attitude that we've got something very special and we're not going to undersell it or ourselves. And which is wonderful, you know, even if any of us had any doubts about it, we were like, no, this is the way it is. And I think that real determination, single mindedness is a really important part of succeeding. It's like, no, there's no doubt this will not fail. So we went out there and met these people and Mark Fox was introducing us to songwriters. We met Matt and Biff, who we wrote Wannabe and To Become One, Be Forever. And we also met absolute who we wrote who do you think you are too much with those guys and they were managed by a guy called pete and he was in simon's offices and simon heard the music and wanted to meet us so he was the first person who approached us and eventually you signed with virgin virgin mm. records virgin yeah. records yeah we, we gave everyone the run around and we got the money up and up and up and up as you could in those days and we just loved virgin it was an incredible team and we just had so much fun with them. They really shared our vision. Great A&R, Ashley Newton, you know, obviously Spice was such a great album, as is Spice World. Um, so, yeah, it was like a match made in heaven. You, you recount that moment that Simon Fuller gave you your first um, 10K check, I believe. <laughs> and this is before you've released any music, right? So this is like a, is this a signing bonus? Yeah, so we, we got like... Um, you get a advance mm -hmm. when you you know when you sign deal. Not so much these days; it's changed so much. But yeah, you you get an advance, and we hadn't seen like what we would deem as proper money, and that was proper money. Look at all those zeros. <laughs> what did you do with it? Um, I think you know what I did with my first one. Don't no, you? I don't. Do you not? Okay. <laughs> the first thing I did. I do know you went for some <laughs> mic <Mike> shoes. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, this is. As soon as I saw that check, right? Yeah. Never get a check. Yeah. I can I remember like being in, like on this kind of stairwell in this party, give me a check, ten thousand pounds, and I looked at it and I was like, I went down to Oxford Street, JD Sports, and I bought the Nike Air Max that I've been like, yeah, I've had my eye on for weeks. I've named it. <laughs> and what did you do with the rest? Just leave it in the bank. Um, what did I do with the rest? I think I paid for some driving lessons. Oh. Um, yeah, I paid for my rent. And I mean, pretty much when you, you get an advance, whether it's with the record company or publishing, it's your living expenses. You know, when you're a young artist and you've not released anything, that's kind of what it goes on. How quickly did things move from the, the point of getting that check on that stairwell to um, Wannabe, the first single, mm -hmm. taking off? How, how quickly was that? Gosh, are you, you're really uh, testing my memory now. I think, I want to say it was around Christmas time when we, when we got the check. And then Wannabe was released in July of 96. So maybe about six months. Six months. It's, it's, not, it's not very long time, is it? It's not. And it's, it, from what I read, the Wannabe didn't take a long time to record either. <laughs> <laughs> didn't. For a single, I didn't wrote it, and it was definitely under half an hour. There's, there's, we kind of disagree. Was it fifteen minutes? Was it twenty minutes? I mean, it was kind of thrown together. It was. Was it ever going to be a song? We weren't sure. We were just kind of being silly. And Matt and Biff, who are incredible, just obviously made it into something which it went to number one in thirty-seven countries. I mean, I don't think I even knew there was thirty-seven countries. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. How, what, do, what, what, what does that feel like? So you release that single, then you start getting the, the, the murmurs, the noise, the, the world starts vibrating a little bit. What is, that, what is that like? Well, we had big ideas. We probably had big ideas above our station before we should have done. 
but it helped us. Our original management were always like, don't get too big for your boots. You know, you haven't done anything yet. You need, you've got work to do. And we're like, we know we've got work to do, but we've got something special and we are going to make this happen. So we were always like, we felt we were very important and very special. And when other people started to think that too, one of you was released, it was still early days, but we released our album in Japan because at the time there was no internet. So artists would release music in different territories at different times. So you could kind of catch up with yourself, with your promo. Mm -hmm. You were able to do it. I'd like to say you had time to do it, but hey, there's only seven days in a week. Our schedule was insane. But we started in Japan and one of you went to number one while we were in Japan. So we didn't really get a sense of what was happening at home. And I think when we flew back to the UK, we were in Japan for about two weeks. When we, when we flew back, everything had changed. And that was it when it was, when people really did start recognizing us in the street. Yeah, it all started to, yeah, increase at that point. And how did that feel at first? It was so exciting. It was kind of like, it's almost like you put in a, like in a catapult, you know, you've been, you've been doing all this work, doing all this work, you know, and then you're, you're gone and you're just on this like, oh. And it really was, <laughs> I, I was trying to make sure I had the dates right before because when I was looking at the, the, the amount of time from that first single to the number one albums and the meteoric global superstardom, it feels like this much time. I was like, I'm sure I've got the dates wrong. There must be like a decade like typo somewhere because mm -hmm. it was just a couple of years. It's crazy. You know, it's not even a full two years, right? One of these released in July 1997. Jerry left the band in the spring of 98, when we were two shows short of our European leg of the tour. So it wasn't a full two years that the five were together doing the thing, you know? It's... That's mad. I don't understand that. Right? We got together in 94. That's when we all first met. So together a couple of years beforehand. But yeah, by 98, spring of 98, Jerry had gone. We went on to do our US leg of the tour as a four piece. We come back, Melanie and Victoria had their babies. So obviously everything started to change by that point. It was a very different chapter in the lives of the Spice Girls at that point. In my head, the Spice Girls were like two decades. <laughs> you can't get rid of us. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why. Maybe the music lasted, obviously, but... Uh, but it, it, when I was reading that, it was like two years. I was like, what? How is that possible? How is... Two, two, um, two albums. And a movie. And a world tour. And yeah. And all those MTV music videos that were playing in my house constantly because yeah. of my sister. Um, yeah, blame your sister. But I listened to a couple of the odd CD when no one was in the house, but <laughs> it's my podcast, we can edit that out. Um, but, but when you think about why you were successful, because there were a lot of other girl bands at that time, and there were even other girl bands that had a similar fundamental message, message of empowerment. Mm -hmm. And as you, you call it, girl power. I think you can't say that anymore. I think that's a bit of a, people don't like using the, me using the word girl, but um, girl power and feminism and, and female empowerment. Why, are, in hindsight, do you think that you broke through um, and, and these others who were there before you and in some situations were much better placed? Mm -hmm. Why did you win? I think the stars were in alignment Whatever the magic was with that dynamic, that we are so different, that we are quite strong in our individuality, that we made the decision to dress how we each felt comfortable. You know, girl bands before us had coordinated their look or had a certain look, and we realized that didn't work for us. We wanted to make pop music. We loved pop music. We loved so many genres, but we felt like there was a, a space for a female band. You know, we kind of looked at bands like Take That and New Kids on the Block. And there was no girl bands doing that. And that's what we wanted to do. And I just think just all those little elements, a lot of them accidental, you know, our nicknames, which we never came up with. It wasn't a marketing idea. It was Top of the Pops magazine, Peter Lorraine, who was editor there at the time, just thought it'd be really fun to give us some nicknames. And they stuck and they became part of the brand, you know, and they still live on to this day. I mean, in the US, we're known mainly by our nicknames. So, 
yeah, I, I, the stars, like I say, it feels like they were just in alignment. It was meant to be. We had this idea that something was going to happen, but I think it was written in the stars. Timing seems to be quite um, important in hindsight as well. When you think about where the world was, was it ready for this message? Was it ready for a band like this? Um, Because, you know, if you'd been maybe 10 years earlier, maybe it wouldn't have worked out or 10 years later. But there's, it's funny, the the, the case of timing. And then even when you think back to being handed that flyer, the timing of that, and it's quite serendipitous and, you know, the butterfly effect of just these, these things linking up and... Can be quite spooky. Yeah, it really is. You know, you're right. At the time, so it was the '90s. It was a period of growth in the UK. You know, it was quite a positive time for the country. We just kind of come out of the grunge years musically. Mm. Um, indie was big here, and you know, we can't, you know, say, oh, you know, oh, you're welcome, female empowerment. Yes, we we brought that. This was something that was bubbling and moving and changing. And we were just really fortunate that we hit it at a time when more and more people were, were, were getting on it, you know? Mm. Um, and I think because, you know, people often talk about feminism with the Spice Girls. And it's like, we feel like, you know, we were young. We had a point to prove. We wanted to be a girl band for girls. And we wanted to talk about female empowerment and how girls could do whatever they wanted to do. No one was telling us we couldn't do something. And it enabled us to take feminism and make it more, you know, palatable to a younger audience. You know, we had fans of three years of age. A pop band or a music act had never had that before. You know, and even now, you know, it's amazing. I do these shows and I go out and I do solo stuff and I do a couple of Spice Girl songs. And there's so many young kids in the audience loving and re- discovering the Spice Girls. Mm. And it's it's incredible. It still captures their imagination. That, um, that pressure, though, people often talk about the pressure of being in a band. But the pressure of being in a girl band at that time, especially when even, you know, the media... Were, were very vicious and there wasn't a, an awareness around the impact of words on mental well-being and how that can impact people um strikes me as being an even more difficult time than today of being in well we have social media now in, which is also an exacerbating factor but talk to me about the the pressure of public scrutiny back then on young women you're right you know the tabloid media were brutal i think things have improved not that much. I mean, it is quite shocking now when I look back at articles from the 90s and noughties, just like the wording that was used. I think they're just a bit more sneaky with it now. You know, they're still saying the same things, but in a slightly different way. But back then it was just brutal. I mean, I got called, we all got called, like terrible, horrible things. And as a young person, I think for anyone, and you're right, you know, the generation now have social media to deal with it, which I think is equally as damaging, if not more so in many ways, because you can't escape it, can you? You know, your phone is there. I wake up, first thing I do, look at my phone. Um, Luckily now I have the skin of a rhino. (laughs) So if anyone's saying anything negative about me, um, you know, I can can usually brush it off. But yeah, back then it was, I was trying to figure out who I was. You know, who am I? These people are telling me I'm this thing. You know, they're criticising me, I'm I'm not talented enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm stupid, I'm a loudmouth, I'm this. And it's like, who am I? Am I who I want to be? Am I who they tell me I am? Should I be who they want me to be? And it's so confusing. And that was, I think, another, you know, we were talking about these different elements that got me, because I became very, very ill. Um, around 2000 and you know the the eating and the exercising and from chicks words and certain things that had happened being photographed constantly but being commented on constantly was a big factor in that journey your demeanor changed when i talked when i mentioned that Did it? it looked like it genuinely i could i could see how that that phase of your life had impacted you just from the the change in your <laughs> quite emotional um yeah, it's, I don't think anyone can ever, you know, it's really hard, you know, because I'm always in this place where there's a, I'm always in this place where there's an element of guilt attached to my success. 
And I think that's exacerbated by people going, well, you're famous. You know, you put yourself in that position. And something I explore in the book is, you know, people who want to be famous, probably are the people least well equipped to do with it because, you know, we're, we're looking for acceptance and love and adoration and to be that vulnerable and to put yourself in that position only to be criticised is, is a bad combination. And I think, you know, with the tabloid media as it was back then, I mean, it's horrific. I mean, I've looked again recently because, you know, there's been certain reasons why I've been having to read old articles on myself and I'm shocked. I'm shocked at the things they used to say. I am, um, I mean, I don't want to jump forward too far with the story, but I, I did suffer with a couple of eating disorders, one of them being binge eating disorder. I was very depressed and I gained some weight because I've been underweight for a long, long time. And my body was just like, it was just a reaction. It was like, I am starved of any nourishment. Yeah, but heal me, feed me. And, you know, obviously the big change in that made me gain weight. And it wasn't an enormous amount of weight. I think I went from a size, probably about a size, I suppose it, it does sound like a lot if you say like a size six to a size 14. But then a size 14, I don't think is even the average size of women in the UK. And they called me sumo spice. I mean, how disgusting is that? So whoever this person is, I'm not going to say it's a guy. It, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. The editor probably was. But they thought it was appropriate to call a young woman who actually had been open because she kind of felt she had to be about her issues and it was okay to call her sumo spice. How sick is that? It's really fucked up, isn't it? Mm. I mean, worse things happen to people. And, you know, worse things happen in the world. But in this, in my world, at that time, when that happened, it was devastating. Gosh, it's disgusting, isn't it? They couldn't do it now. They couldn't do that now. But like I say, they it's all a little bit reading between the lines now, isn't it? You you were so young then as well. You were, you know, you're in your teen years, but you're still a child at that age. And as you say, learning who you are and what you mean. Was there a moment where you realised that, so that first comment from Chick sends you changes your behaviour. Was there a moment where you look back on and go, that was maybe this, not the second catalyst moment, but my behavior took a really sharp turn there in terms of like exercise and obsessing over food and fitting in. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was more when we were in the public eye, being photographed, doing lots of photo shoots. Um, yeah, I, you know, some of it is linked to a, a need of control, isn't it? Because things at that point felt very much out of our control even though we, we, you know, we wanted to take this thing, you know, in our own hands and we wanted to make it happen. Um, I think because when things with the Spice Girls became uber successful, which was very mm -hmm. quick after the release of Wannabe, were flying all over the world. You're, you're in a bubble. You're in this crazy bubble. And it's great. You're having an amazing time. But you can't, you can't do things on your own terms anymore. But you can control what you put in your mouth. Or you can be in the gym where people will leave you alone because oh, don't don't bother if she's in the gym. You write about how you turn into a robot. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by a robot? Okay, so I think I found it the only way I could survive the experience was by switching off my feelings. Um, I had to eat a certain way. I had to exercise a certain amount. And I couldn't not do it. So I had to switch off any of those like human emotions or any of those, just even listening to my own body. This, there was a task that had to be done and I had to complete it. I'm a robot, I must do it. And that was kind of my inner dialogue. And you recount this, um, this day of rec reciting some, reciting that while being on a running machine, which I found very, almost quite unnerving and quite mm. strange, looking in the mirror and telling yourself that you're a robot. Yeah. That actually happened, you, you were looking in the <laughs> I, I can I can completely remember being in the gym right now in the treadmill, kind of in the middle of a row of treadmills, and yeah, that was that was my way of coping, to like shut down, shut off, 
just like just this body is just a piece of machinery that will do what it has to do and there was no there was no choice that was the thing there was no choice that was the way it had to be and it wasn't until I had which by all you know I, I imagine was a breakdown in 2000 when I just you know I hit rock bottom and and that's when I, I kind of fell apart because the robot wasn't working anymore have you when you think back at that young girl have you got how do you feel about her as an as an as an you know much more mature person now yeah. how do you feel about that young girl that was going through that i feel really sad for her i feel like you know it was the most incredible time of my life and the hardest and as much as i enjoyed it it was joyless you know because i had a secret and I was dealing with what I had to deal with and living my dream at the same time. It, it was, it's a, it's a head fuck is what it is because I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. I changed that. I changed that I became the victim of an eating disorder and exercising obsessively. I wish that hadn't happened to me. So I could have fully enjoyed the wonderful things that happened to me 100%. You know, life isn't perfect. There's always issues. There's always things we have to overcome. But it was fucking dramatic in how it went down. What would you say to her if you could speak to her? I'd say sorry. I do. I feel so sorry that I did that to her. Yeah. I think I've been angry as well. I think I've aimed anger at other people. But I think as, as an adult, you have to take responsibility for your actions. Um, you know, I don't want to sound bitter and twisted, but, there, you know, there were people or, you know, the tabloid media. I don't want to bitch and moan about the tabloid media, but, you know, they probably need to be bitched and moaned about because they've been disgraced. Um, but, yeah, I just, I, I, I feel sorry. I feel regretful. So what would you say sorry to her for? For putting her through that. Putting her through that. For, and, it, and it feels like I kind of, I have a lot of guilt attached to what I was representing, but what was really going on behind closed doors. And you know what? I'm such an honest person. I can't, I can't lie. I'm so bad at lying. And I, I feel so dishonest if I'm not burying myself to people. But I was living a lie. And that's probably the hardest part of it. That, um, that secret, the secret you're referring to is the eating disorder and the obsessive exercising. Mm -hmm. Right, the secret you were keeping. When you say um, eating disorder, are you referring to the binge eating disorder? That was that was did that come after? That was later. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, and the the weird thing is actually, as you as you put it like that, it's like I was in denial for a long time as well. You know, because there is a little voice that goes, "You can't carry on like this," but then the other voice, the bigger voice, goes, "You haven't got a choice." And the first eating disorder I, I started to um just to eat less smaller portions and then i started to eliminate food groups um to a point because i was terrified of fat and then i was terrified of carbs and then i wouldn't eat a banana because it's got too much sugar in it I, I, I mean i do not even know how i survived and i think often now i get so exhausted i think it's probably through years of being malnourished um I lived on fruit and vegetables for about two years and I was underweight, my period stopped, you know, I kind of, I've always wanted to be a mum, but I had no choice but to live this life I was living and I was jeopardising the chance of being a mum. I mean, how crazy is that? It's just this compulsion. And then it all comes to a head in 2000 when the... Yeah. I... I think like a lot of, and I'm going to say a lot of women, but a lot of people really hate their bodies. You know, we, oh, I hate this. Or we used to get asked in interviews, or, you know, what, what's your favourite, what would you call them, like your favourite attribute or whatever? You know, what, what, do you, what do you like least about yourself? You know, what? Oh, stupid fucking questions. Why would you, why would you ever say, never be negative in, a, in an interview, right? Never pull people towards your vulnerability. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I hate my, my short stubby legs. You know what I mean? Just really focus on them. Um, 
But yeah, I, I, I hated myself. I was never good enough. Nothing's good enough. Women do this all the time. We pull ourselves apart. You know, I'm not funny enough. I'm not clever enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not sexy enough. All these things. And it's like, fuck, this body is amazing. And I spent all of those years just hating it because it wasn't what I wanted it to be. But you are not your body. You know, I, I was talking to my family this weekend. I, I lost an elder sibling a few years ago. And we were talking about when people pass and, you know, and sadly he died of cancer. And we know in the last stages, people with cancer, it's, it's awful to see them in that way. But I don't remember him in that way. I remember the essence of him. I remember how funny he was and how naughty he was. And, and it's not, I don't, I don't remember anything physical, you know, and it's just, we just need to get away from this physical being what defines us, fuck off, it's not what defines us, we are so much more than that. And um, I've completely forgotten what the question was, but I just got caught up no, in that. I, no, I it's so, it's so powerful. And yeah. um, it was linked to it all, all of that sort of suppression and yeah. self-abandonment coming to a head in 20, 20, 2000. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. And I, I'd, I'd spent years like trying to make myself smaller, you know, fit into the form that I should be to be doing the thing that I'm doing and it was killing me and and I, this is why I started talking about my body because I'm so grateful to my body because it took over and it's and it said to me we can't do this anymore you're not doing this anymore we are taking the control away from you and it was hard because from being very restrictive with my eating and being anorexic I started binge eating because my body it couldn't cope anymore it wasn't getting enough fuel and I was depressed I didn't know I was depressed I had no I, that never even crossed my mind that I had depression I just knew I'd lost control over my eating and that freaked me out because it was all about the way I looked you know it was it, it was vanity I was like fuck I'm eating I'm eating loads and you know I feel very grateful I was never bulimic I tried I couldn't make myself sick. And I, I'm so grateful for that because I know it's a really difficult illness to recover from. So I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger because I was eating more and more and more. Um, and then that was, it was the vanity that took me to the doctors as well as being really fucking scared because I didn't know what was going on. And I was struggling to get out of bed. And that was when I was diagnosed with depression. And that was my first step on the road to recovery. You go to that doctor who ultimately diagnoses you with depression. Can you remember that day vividly? Yeah, I do. I really do. I remember sitting opposite him at his desk. And I think I said everything out loud for the first time about my eating, about crying and not being able to sleep out. I mean, I didn't have the words. I didn't know what anxiety was. I didn't know what depression was. So, What did you say to him? Just Because I, I want to get a colour of what the symptoms were that you hadn't yourself yeah. pinpointed as... Well, I was, I was tired all the time. I couldn't control my eating. I mean, I was, I, I terrified myself because sometimes I'd catch myself mid binge. It was so, it was such a compulsive thing. I'd like, yeah, I'd just be in the middle of just eating and I'd be like, what are you fucking doing? You know, and anyone, and then sadly I know lots of people have these issues. It's like a cycle because you do it and then you hate yourself. So you do it again and then you, you just, it just keeps, uh, you know, getting worse and worse and to the point where I had to go to the doctor. But I felt like I was losing my mind. I felt like I was actually going mad. And yeah, and I didn't have the right words. And I know they are not the right words that we use today, mm. but those were the words I had. Um, yeah, and he said, well, first of all, we have to, you know, we have to deal with your depression. And I was like, and it was like this weight was just lifted from my shoulders because it was like, oh my God, it's got a name. It's something that can be treated. It's something you can recover from. And that was the beginning of a very, very long journey. A very, very long journey. A very long journey, mm. yeah. I think I'm still on that journey, to be honest. I don't think, I think depression is always there. It's always waiting in the wings, it's looming. Um, well, it is for me, anyway. Um, but I'm, I'm quite good at just keeping it at bay. You learn the tricks and the tools to keep it at bay. You you describe um I believe the um the fear of that looming um depression or you know 
I guess the fear of going back to former ways or for finding yourself in that situation has has been quite a scary thing. Is it a scary thing? Something you're 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 scared of? I don't want to mischaracterize your words there, but I, um, is it something that sits at the back of your mind in terms of you know that you you fear there might be there? It's like a catalyst. There could be one thing that could. Yeah, the thing I fear the most is depression because. You know, I've, I've always felt like there's a fire in my belly and even, you know, mostly at my lowest of points, I can go, this will pass, we can do this. But there are times within my depression where I have doubted that. And yeah, that's my I might need a minute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> mm. My biggest fear is it's that, you know, really overwhelming depression where you doubt <clears throat> if you can make it through beyond it. You ha- do you have those moments post mainly where you didn't think you'd be able, you, there was doubt whether you'd be able to make it through a moment. Is this post leaving the Spice Girls predominantly or was there moments throughout the experience where? It's never, we've never officially split up as the Spice Girls. Oh really? Yeah. We took that decision because there was so much press, you know, interest in us at the time. So, you know, I was really, really struggling. We were working on Forever, which is the third album as a four piece without Jerry. And I'd worked on my solo records and I, and I was having a really, really hard time and it was too much. I found the environment too much and I think the girls knew me too well. You know, I was I was dealing with these demons, these inner demons, and they, they could just read me like a book. And I just didn't want to be in their company because I had to deal with it myself, you know. So I, I did want to leave the band. But we, we took the decision to never officially split up because we because we didn't want the press, press intrusion. We were terrified. Mm-hmm. Of, cause we knew, I mean, I slipped up once on a TV show. I did a show with Frank Skinner and I used past tense. I said, when I was a Spice Girl, or whatever the wording I used was, and the press jumped on it. And there was camera crews outside my house in it. Really? And they chased me down the road. And yeah, and it was just like, we, we couldn't, none of us could face and the, the you know the beauty of that is now we kind of feel like at the time we needed separation you know we'd be in like this our lives have been so intertwined that we needed that space but now we've had time to do that and grow and become individual individuals and mums and and have these separate lives we can come back together and we we really enjoy each other and respect each other so it, we quite like that we've never split up you know mm. like, we always We'll always be Spice Girls. When people say former Spice I'm not a former Spice Girl. I am a Spice Girl. And we will always all be Spice Girls. Even Victoria, when she didn't get on stage in 2019, she's still a very, very important part of that show. 2019. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you know, you recount in your book about how coming back together was actually a really pleasant experience and it, it taught you a lot about your previous time together in the, in the Spice Girls. But let's start with the point about Victoria then. A lot of, lot was written about that. Obviously, when press do interviews, they're trying to twist your words and find something. Wow, how can we turn them against each other? Like, that's what, that's the game, right? They do. Um, so how, how did you all feel when, you, you know, you knew that Victoria wasn't coming back to the group and you were going to be doing it as a fool? Yeah, there, there was a few feelings about that because obviously we were gutted. Mm. You know, but you would we be. wanted her there. Yeah. Totally wanted her. And we were scared. Because we thought, shit, are people going to want us as a four piece, um, you know, in a different configuration? And the thing is, you know, let's not, you know, well, let's be honest here. Victoria is a huge international icon. You know, she has gone on to be something in her own right, you know, in the fashion world, in the world of celebrity. She's much bigger than the others of us individually. Um, I don't think anything's as big as the Spice Girls. You know, we all feel that. But without her, it's like, people are going to take us seriously. Um, so, yeah, so there was, there was different feelings around it. The, the wonderful thing about it was she was very supportive and it was really important for us to make sure she was happy. So she was involved creatively. You know, we wanted her to sign everything off. We wanted her to know exactly what we were going to do. 
And it was such an incredible experience. I, it felt like she was part of it anyway. Why didn't you... I didn't. I missed the story at that time, but why didn't she want to be... What was her public statement? What was the reason? The public statement is because of family and commitment. Okay. Which is completely, you know, yeah. understandable. Um, but I think, you know, on a more personal level, and, and I think this has been said, I, I don't think she'd mind me saying, when we did the Olympics in 2012... Yeah. She had a really hard time. Okay. It was, she was petrified. I mean, we were all bloody petrified, but to the point where it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it was it, so, you know, it was, she had a lot of anxiety around mm. that performance that she was like, you know what, girls, I'm putting my dancing shoes up, mm. um, away. So, yeah, so we totally got it. You know, we respected her decision. Mm. Um, but yeah, but we were still sad about it. But you know what? We went on to have the most successful tour we've ever done um you know with her blessing sadly without her but we did it and it was incredible and it really is truly some of my happiest spice girls memories one of the things that i wish i'd asked liam payne when i spoke to him about one direction and the the group dynamic and then what happens when the group are no longer making music Mm. at the time i don't want to say split up because that is a bit loaded but when they're no longer together is um what what happens in the outside world in the media is people then start comparing the the like the post band successes, mm-hmm. and I think this can be very very toxic because you're then being compared against in the case of like One Direction these four five other four other individuals you're then sort of measured your life then becomes measured against who did the best after it was measured during yeah. as you talk about in magazines where they said who is the hottest and who is the this and I, yeah exactly um, but then post. You've got, you know, as it relates to One Direction, you've got Harry Styles, who is just, you know, yeah, untouchable. untouchable. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I wonder, like, no matter how, how amazing the objective success is of, like, another member, are they, they're always compared to this person. Yeah. How true is that in your case? Um, yeah, it, it's true. It's so hard. It's so hard to go on and, and become a solo artist because you, like, this is what, like, really drives me mad about the media, right? They tell you things you already know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, I was interested in you. They just want the Spice Girls. I know. Um, but no, I mean, that isn't totally true. But it, yeah, yeah, you're right. It's really, really hard because we get compared so much within the band and then post the band. But it's like, you know, you you, ha- you have to have this logical brain, don't you, where you go, you know, how do we measure success? You know, for me, the areas of my life, I am so happy, I'm so successful, and there are others, they need a bit of work. But I think as a, as a fully grown adult, you have to go, stop comparing yourself. You know, other people might want to do it, but you can't do it. We all do it. We all look on Instagram. We go, oh, our life's amazing. Bullshit. No one's life is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's something going on. So I, I think, yeah, it's just, we go off, don't we, on little tangents sometimes, but it's just to just come back home and, yeah, concentrate on the important things. You, when, you, when you went on that, the reunion tour, what did you learn about your former experience from that tour? I learned it was a shame that we couldn't fully appreciate it at the time because... And you're never going to change history and you're never going to change things moving forward because it's so chaotic and new at the time that you're just a little bit in survival mode. You know, you're just kind of at points going through the motions. You know, I meet younger artists now, like I've been lucky enough to meet Billie Eilish a few times. And I I I relate to her so much. I think I, I saw her perform at Shepherd's Bush Empire and she was already way too big to be playing that incredible venue. And all these predominantly teenage girls were screaming for her, screaming at her and singing her songs. And it just made me go back to Spice Girls shows. I know she's very different as an artist, but I just kind of felt this kinship with her. And so at times I just look at her and I kind of feel like I I know what she's feeling and what she's going through. So whenever I have the opportunity to see her, I just kind of have this little connect with her. And it's just like... Why does that make you emotional? Because this incredible thing happens to you and it's so hard to appreciate it because it's so intense, you know? Because that experience was so tumultuous for you, because there were so many difficulties, as you approached the reunion, was there fear of 
you know, the, the former issues, as well as the good times, but also the bad times coming with that. Always. Whenever us girls get together, there's, there's little triggers, you know, and I'm scared, but I have to face them because, you know, I've learned through experience of the other things I've gone on to do with the girls. We re reunited in 2007, the Olympics, 2019. Face the fear and actually beautiful things happen. So, yeah, and, you know, we're much more mindful of each other now as well because, you know, everyone had their shit to deal with. You know, it wasn't plain sailing for anyone. Was that too much of the reason you were inspired to write your book? Yeah, it totally was. Why? I mean, you know, sometimes I still question it. I'm still questioning it as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just felt, I, I started to feel like, my story's incredible. You know, I, I'm just... I'm just a girl, I'm a normal girl from the Northwest, working class background, and I have achieved my dreams. And I go on to work in this industry, work as an international artist. I mean, it blows my mind when I think about what I've achieved, what I've continued to go on to do. And, and I want to inspire people. And I've, gosh, I've had hard times. You know, I've had times when I've thought, I don't know if I can carry on. I don't know if I can carry on in this industry. I don't know if I can carry on in this life, but I've done it. And and I just really hope that people can read this book and have a laugh. You know, there's been some funny bits and some great memories, but be inspired and, and also find some hope within it. Because, you know, I have, I, I personally, for me, feel like I've been at rock bottom at a time, but I've worked my way up back up to like feeling okay and feeling great sometimes so yeah I know I know people lots of people struggle with some of the issues that I've had to deal with why what, what stops you from writing this book sooner fear a bit scared a bit scared to go back to those times I knew it was going to be hard it was actually harder than I thought it was going to be um really yeah and Recording the audio book, which is something I definitely wanted to do, that's a lot. It's a lot, because I think to write those words is one thing, but then to speak them is something else. Um, you can be interviewed and talk about these situations, but kind of going through it chronologically is, is really, really draining. Yeah. You've just been write, um, reading the audio book out in a studio. You sit there alone in these um, audio book recordings in a small room. Is that... Is that yeah, same experience exactly, yeah. and you read through this this book that you've just written um what was the hardest part for you to read i'm only halfway through okay <laughs> i haven't even got to the really tough but yeah um but I, you know what's weird i wonder if you would find this too sometimes it's the things you don't expect mm -hmm. to get yeah get yeah I, I got really upset the other day when I started reading a part, I, I can't even remember which bit it was, but it, it really surprised me. Because I know there's like chapter 14, is it like ingrained in my brain, chapter 14, <laughs> um, is when I talk about my eating disorders and, and depression and, and that, the really lowest point um, of my life. I know that's going to be hard to read. I've not got there yet. Um, but yeah, some of the other points have, have been quite emotional and is that is that part hard to read and recount now because because of those feelings you described earlier where you have the sadness for that young goat's version of yourself and you you also said anger is that why it's hard to, to even read it out now you know I, i'm really curious to see how i'm going to do on chapter 14 <laughs> because i think i've built up like this resilience to it as well because I, I've spoken quite openly in the media about depression and eating disorders. And I actually started talking about it probably before I was ready. Because at the time I, I felt like, you know, being a Spice Girl, it felt like it was your duty that our lives were in the public domain. And, you know, it was such a weird time because there were so many things going on, you know, there was so much exposed about myself and other people in, in the entertainment industry. Um, because of phone hacking. You know, there were so many secrets and things that probably would never have made the papers, but you know, they were listening to people's messages. We know that now, this is a fact. So yeah, there was this, I felt like I, I had to spill my guts and I was still very vulnerable and, and still very ill. You know, I wasn't anywhere near on the road to recovery. You know, it was just the very beginning for me. 
So I've, I've had to build up the, uh, this wall around me. So I, I wonder whether I can speak about that now and it not affect me emotionally. I'm curious to see. Is that all a good thing? I think it's a necessary thing, you know? Yeah. I think some of the other points in the book, you know, are talking about my childhood and my parents and and they're quite new things. I've not really discussed them openly before. Um, so they're quite hard. And also going to affect other people. Mm. But that's what's been hard about this book. It's not just about me. That's like fame, right? Fame just doesn't happen to you, does it? It happens to everybody around you. And they didn't ask for it. <laughs> mm. So, and then the guilt kicks in again. There's a lot of guilt attached to fame, I think. I had a few words to say about one of my sponsors on this podcast. For many years, people have been asking for a coffee-flavoured Huel. And quite recently, Huel released the iced coffee caramel flavour of their um, ready-to-drink Huels. And I've just become hooked on it over the last couple of weeks. I've been on a really interesting journey with Huel, which I've described and talked about a little bit on this podcast. I started with the berry ready-to-drinks, then I moved over to the protein salted caramel because it's 100 calories and it gives you all of your essential vitamins and minerals, but also gives you the 20-odd grams of protein you need. And now I'm balanced between them both. I drink mostly the banana flavour flavor ready to drink. I've got really into the iced coffee caramel um, flavor of, of Huel's ready to drink. And now I'm drinking that as well as the protein. Make sure you try the new ready to drink flavors. The, the caramel flavor is amazing. The um, new banana flavor as well is amazing. And obviously, as I said, the iced coffee caramel flavor has been a real smash hit. So check it out. Let me know what you think on social media. I see all of your tags and in Instagram posts and tweets about Huel. Where is your line in terms of sharing stuff? This is something that I always think about. Um, obviously, I have a podcast, so I talk a lot about my childhood and all the things that happened. And I've always wondered, you know, there's being transparent and honest because it will help others that have gone through that experience. And that's really important. That's how we all learn. You saying one thing can quite literally save lives. Um, but where is your personal line in terms of... Because you kind of alluded to it there, where there's things where you just can't... Maybe it's not the right time or... I think, you know, what's really important with this book is it's my story and it's in my words and it's my perspective. And I think the line for me is, you know, it's not my place to tell other people's stories and, you know, to the point of hurting other people. Uh, that That's, I can't, I, I, I couldn't live with myself. Um, but I know sometimes we hurt people unintentionally. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's probably my fear around the book coming out now. Um, it's not my intention to hurt anybody. I've tried to be very careful. Um, but obviously, like your parents reading how you feel about things, you know, that's that's going to hurt. Mm. When, one of the things as well that fascinated me was um, your relationship with, with money, you know, um, and this, this suggestion that you had almost guilt for your success. I've heard that a few times on this on this um, podcast, and it always seems to come from people that have a working class background. Yeah. Can you tell me about that in your from your perspective? I think for me, it's you know, I all around me, all of my family, all of my friends' families, everybody works really hard. You know, really hard, whatever you know, world they work in. It can be manual labour. It can be you know, I mean, my dad. God bless him, he's in his 70s, he's still travelling around the world like a young man doing this crazy job, doing super long hours. And, you know, my dad loves his job, but it's, you know, it's a necessity to work that hard to put food on the table, to pay the bills, right? I, my my work can be hard, it can be gruelling, but I go on stage and I sing and it's my passion and I'm very lucky to do it. And sometimes I could maybe earn in a day what people in my family might earn in a year, you know? And, and so there's guilt attached to that. When, um, when you think about the, the thing that made you successful the first time around, you, you talk about it a lot, that, and I talk about it as well, that insecurities were one of my biggest drivers. They were this, you know, you're, you're trying to fill some kind of void and you end up, it ends up resulting in perfectionism and overworking and all those things. How do you control that, sort of those inner insecurities that I could probably ask this question in a different way. Those things that drove you then, yeah. which ultimately are quite unhealthy and toxic and end up creating a lack of balance in one's life. Mm-hmm. How do you stop those things driving you now? How do you stop being toxic driven? 
<laughs> you know what? I think actually age does that for you because you're so exhausted. <laughs> right, yeah. You haven't got the energy right. <laughs> to be that. You know, I, I think the thing is, you know, we live and learn, don't we? And I'm a mum now. So I have a different set of priorities. I love my work. Sometimes I get the balance completely wrong. You know, I'm with the book and everything, my workload is huge right now. It's the school holidays, you know, I'm not around enough for my daughter, so it's eating me up inside. But, you know, I, I will find the time and we've got holiday plans. And, and I, I think it's just kind of learning from past mistakes mm. that, you know, be driven, but not to the point where it's detrimental. The biggest mistake I made as a young person was I believed other people knew better than I did. No one knows better than you about you. Just listen. Just and it, oh, it's so beautiful. Like, I spent so much time this weekend with like really young people in front of me, and and I just look at them and I just think, just don't lose the essence of you. You know, because because I think when you're a kid, I mean, obviously people have different circumstances, but this essence of you has all the answers. It's all you need. You know, and then life comes in and just like makes it all a bit out of balance. So I just like really encourage young people to just really, you know, trust their instincts. I'm really, I've been really, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. I've been thinking, because when I go up on stage and I try, try and give people advice, you know, sometimes you, people will often sometimes overcomplicate the answer. But as I've like looked back at my own life and what I'm hearing from you as well is that I, I knew the answer the whole, whole time, but there was a narrative that persuaded me to ignore it. So sometimes that can be your your immigrant parents telling you to go and become a doctor or a lawyer when you really want to just dance. And so you, you kind of place their narrative o over the top of your own feeling. And so, and then the other one can sometimes be social media, which tells you that you should be an X or a Y or a Z. But inside of you, I, th I think it's really liberating to consider that you might already have all the answers if you just listened yeah. and tuned out these other voices. Easier said than done. Super right? easier said than but, done. Almost impossible. Yeah, and I think the thing is as well, it's like, because you think it can't be that simple. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, it can. <laughs> maybe, 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 especially if the answer is happiness. If it is ma material success, then maybe you should go and be a doctor. But if it is happiness, which I think is the answer in, in the long term, if you don't want to avoid a midlife crisis when you're in your doctor's suit at 40 and you go, what the fuck am I doing here? Whatever. Um, maybe that is the approach to take. But yeah. I also want to say, life is a series of chapters, right? So what's right at one point might change. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, that is the thing as well. It's like, okay, a decision might be made and you're following a path. And then at some point you're like, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. So you can change. I think that's, I think that's really powerful to know. I mean, it's fucking scary. And not everybody has the luxury of just going, okay, I'm going to change my career. I'm going to move house. I'm going to you know, move country, whatever. But I think what's powerful is actually you have the power hmm. you just got to find the way to do it yeah, yeah. the practical way to yeah. i think that's the most important thing um one of the, the other things i wanted to ask you about is when i reflect on my own early upbringing with my parents and the, and the model of love that they taught me not all great what impact did the model of relationships and the separation of your parents have on your own model of of a relationship and love if any i think the biggest impact that my my parents' relationship and breakdown of their relationship and my childhood is telling me is that I yearn for a family. Yeah. I yearn for that security. Um, and I, I have a little girl. I'm not with her dad. And that was really difficult because I didn't want for my little girl what had happened to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm always I'm always looking for that that environment that I don't feel like I've ever really had. We have got one last question for you. So the last guest asks a question for the next guest, but they don't know who they're asking the question to. So they write a, a question in the book. I don't see it on my mother's life. I don't see it until I open the book. Um, that was the last question. Okay, here we go. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> this is interesting because it's a question we've we've been asked once um before. So it's interesting that it's come up twice. Um what is a pain 
that you enjoy having? Ah, okay. This is interesting. Um, I've had a little emotional turmoil recently. And I was in the gym and I was stretching to the point where it hurts, but it felt good. And I think sometimes, and this is a little bit self-harmy, I think, like physical pain sometimes will alleviate. Like, you know, when I'm exercising to the point of it hurting can help with my emotional pain. You know, exercise is a really interesting thing because, you know, obviously I have a, a difficult relationship with it in a sense because I did used to exercise obsessively, which I don't anymore, but I do exercise a lot. And I do it for my head more so than my body at times. You know, it's really, really important to me. But I can feel so low and so tired and so lethargic and I can go to the gym and I'm a changed person. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a miracle drug, right? Mm. Whether it's the endorphins, the serotonin that's produced, whatever happens. It's like when people say to me, oh, you know, how do you encourage people to do exercise? And it's like, listen, just go, no pressure. Say I'll do 10, 15 minutes and I bet you're there for an hour. It's just I completely together. agree. Yeah. That is, when I was first, when that first, when that question first came into this book, my immediate response was exercise. And I've never really thought, I, I was always curious as to whether there was an element of like escapism there as well. And I, I'm always conscious about escaping issues or, um, and then when you ref refrained it, when you described it then as you, you're going through an emotional pain and the pain of the exercise almost helps to relieve that. It's quite a curious thing because I understand the endorphins and all the chemicals and stuff, but the pain itself being a medicine is an interesting concept. Yeah. The other thing I think with exercise is, because you say about it, because I've used running sometimes, like that thing of running away. Uh. You know, if you're running, no one can catch you. You're running, you're running, right? But it also makes you very present. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are running, you are present. And I've actually done a lot of problem solving when I've been running. Had some little epiphanies as well. So it's, I think exercise is, you know, we were built to move. Let's do it. Melanie, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so really much. Enjoyed that. And your book is um, truly important. I think that's the best the best way to describe it because because the depth of your honesty and the uniqueness of your experience offers means that it offers so much to so many people. And even someone that obviously, I mean, there's probably not there's probably almost no one on, on planet Earth that can relate to the experience itself. But the lessons that are within your book and the lessons that you've managed to pull out of those experiences are lessons that we can all use to change our life. And I, I said to you before we started recording that I usually don't make that many notes and I just, I made way too many. And it's really because I had so, I gained so much from reading it about, you know, even my own life, having not walked in your shoes that um, really helped me in so many ways. And I know that everyone listening to it is gonna gain so much from it. But I also really have to specifically thank you for your honesty around the eating disorders and your depression, because that will quite literally save people's lives. And you may never see it. You may never, you know, get to hear directly from those people. But I assure you of that. It's it definitely, definitely will. So. Well, I thank you so much for saying that because I've, I've been honest in the interview to say that I, I still fear releasing this book. But you know what? If it, if that is the case, and to hear that from you, then I, I feel good. I feel good about it and getting it out there. Thank you. Thank you. I had a few words to say about one of my sponsors on this podcast. Crafted are a brand that sell really meaningful, affordable men's jewellery. And I've been a Crafted customer, I think, for about three years now. And all of the pieces that Crafted have created have deeper meaning. The piece of jewellery I wear the most, I want to introduce you to the pieces and why I wear them, is this sand timer, unsurprisingly. And the thing for me about a sand timer is it's probably the most clear reminder that our time here on earth is finite. And when you live in such a way where you can literally see your time pouring away and you realise that it is scarce and that we're not all here forever, you start to make better decisions. You stop worrying about pettiness and trivialities that consume our lives. I always have this crafted sand timer around my neck as a reminder of that. And this is why I wanted Crafted to sponsor this podcast because I can use their meaningful jewelry every episode to deliver a meaningful message. Uh -huh.